Bismillah. So in the name of Allah, we begin welcoming everybody to the uh, new podcast. Welcome to Behind the Mimbar, uh, Blueprints for a Better Masjid. But what is Behind the Mimbar? Behind the Mimbar, uh, inshallah, will be a, uh, a bunch of frank conversations on the state of most masajid and how to better our religious communities, inshallah, how to consolidate or centralize in a central location some of uh, the most useful perspectives and insights and experiences for people that are doing the work or wanting to do the good work of carrying this deen and advancing the prophetic call uh, and hopefully shortening our learning curve, inshallah ta'ala. So this first episode will be a discussion on uh, when messages disappoint and I'm honored to have our, our brother Khalid, uh, my good friend Khalid. How do I even introduce you, man? Khalid Goose. <laughs> Khalid Goose. <laughs> That's his, uh, his pen name, street name. Uh, so why Khalid? Let me uh, indulge me, if you will. By all means. Uh, Khalid is a friend of mine going on two tech decades now that uh, me and him off and on brainstorm a lot about we save the world over text message. That's what we do a lot of times, right? We try. That's what we <laughs> want to do. Uh, I think we have many similar views, but also thoughtful disagreements that uh, reflect that we have a similar concern and also that we have a lot to learn uh, on how to make this possible. But you are someone that whose sincerity I do admire and I whose uh, well-roundedness. You're, alhamdulillah, a well-read person with uh, an above-average skill, forgive me in abstraction and so welcome and it's an honor to have you as the first guest here in the podcast the, the pleasure is all mine Muhammad. i mean i'm sure a lot of the people who are watching this are from back in our community in new york and since those thursday night lectures yeah i need to to have the opportunity to be here with you speaking with you on this to kind of have this platform i feel like it's above uh me so i hope i can i can live up to what you're trying to do here inshallah so why'd you do it Why'd you agree? I, I need to, to out you now and say there was a lot of reluctance regarding joining me on the podcast, but I kind of insisted in the beginning. So, yeah, look, if you, if you look at like the, the guests you're going to have on this podcast, I imagine they're each going to kind of bring a unique perspective. And uh, the perspective I bring to the table is of someone who was burned by the masajid and the community and uh, unfortunately walked away for years. And uh, it's not something I'm proud of. It uh, it's something I'm gonna ask forgiveness for till the, till like the end of my days. But it's kind of like um, for me, it's it's like the fulfillment of the hero's journey. You know, Yani, I grew up in the Masajid. I grew up in the Muslim community. And when you're in a community, inevitably you kind of identify the things that are going wrong with it. And it's kind of like. Uh, one of the plot lines that took place in The Lion King where you grow up in the kingdom, you know, and at a certain point it's going to be expected of you to take your place in the community and rise up and assume that responsibility of kind of reviving things and, and keeping them going. And for a lot of people, that kind of responsibility proves to be too much. And just like Simba leaves Pride Rock for a while, a lot of us wind up leaving the community for a while, but when you're out there, you come to this realization where it's like, if I don't go back, things are not going to get better. And yeah, I'm out here, I'm partying, I'm living my life, I'm having fun, but I'm not assuming my responsibility. I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And if it's not you who was in the community, who saw the things that were wrong in the community, if it's not you who's going to go back to fix things, to kind of identify what was wrong and, and try to do your part to remedy it, who's going to do it? And inevitably you're going to want to get married and you're going to have children and then your children are going to grow up in that world. And if you didn't take your place in that world and remedy things and fix things and, you know, bring the cure to the sickness in whatever way you can, no one's going to, Yanni. There's a collective responsibility. And so I definitely feel... Uh, some kind of a sense of responsibility. And so that's that's kind of like the driving force, I think, behind a lot of the conversations that we have because those years were rough for me, you know? 
uh, things get really dark on the outside. And I'm sure that there's a lot of other Khalid gooses out there. Mm-hmm. And if I can kind of pull people away from that kind of path, make it so that people don't go away, uh, pull things in a better direction, then I'll be satisfied. Inshallah. I love you. Please with you, Khalid. I mean, I think a big part of, aside from the, uh, uh, the ability to critique objectively and in a, in a mature way, uh, one of the many reasons I love using you as more than a sounding board, of course, like a, a prism for a lot of my thoughts, uh, is the optimism and the ability to try to uh, quiet the pain a bit. We're not going to like move past it, but we're going to move with it, right? <laughs> Listen, so, I wasn't always optimistic. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, but go on, go on. I'll, uh, continue. No, I. that's just what I wanted to say, that that you have grown to a point of optimism now where we can look back and say there were some very valid criticisms mm-hmm. to uh, the, the dynamics we lived in mm-hmm. uh, or lived with in terms of religious institutions, in terms of masajid. And now from a place of being at peace with them, this was my journey. I had to go through it to mm-hmm. be a person that can uh, say... I know what you've been through. I know on the inside what is going on and mm-hmm. still be solution oriented. I think that's huge. Look. So what what uh, were the major disappointments? Well, look, be- before I get into the major disappointments, I, I want to touch on why I try to be optimistic and why I think we should all try to be optimistic. Bismillah. Um, you always like to say that the master identifying the problem is not the same master as the one identifying the solution. So it's really easy to kind of poke holes in everything and figure out what's going wrong and be bitter and nasty about that. But if you're not careful, you're going to kind of become part of the problem. You know, if you go into a nasty and negative environment and you let that infect you and then you become nasty and negative, it's like, look what happened. You know, now you're also nasty and negative And if people are coming into contact with you, they're going to have a nasty and negative experience. And now it's just like, you know, what hurt you is now spreading via you. So I think we all kind of have the decision whether we want to be positive or negative about a situation. And every time you choose to be positive, you're kind of bringing a little bit of light. And, you know, maybe you're showing someone who's also in a bad place. Okay, you know, I can be positive about this and I can have a positive impact on a situation. So... Where do we need to impart some positivity? What were uh, what the dark them? spots? Let's unmask them. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I need the, the first thing off of the top of my head that I could think of that really disappointed me in the Masajid was there was kind of a lack of spirituality is the best way I could put it, where it felt like there was a, a really heavy focus on like the rote repeti- repetitive aspects of the deen. Memorize the Quran, you know, keep up with the prayers, listen to these lectures, but there was nothing that was really speaking to the hearts. There was nothing really speaking to the soul. People come to the masajid with their problem and with their grief and with their pain. And if you're kind of not helping people soothe their pain, if you're not giving people something to kind of lean on, they're going to look for it outside inevitably and outside can't provide it <laughs> outside can't provide it what, what the outside world is providing is it's kind of like a momentary um it's 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 a momentary um what's the word that i'm looking for here euphoria no not the euphoria is not the word that i'm looking for it's it's um it's a momentary escapism you know like there's there's nothing behind the momentary pleasures that are being offered on the outside. So the partying, the drugs, uh, there's there's nothing there. And inevitably, everyone who indulges in it, they come up empty. And so the Masajid don't realize that they're they're up against all of the worldly pleasures here, you know? And it's something that you kind of talk about where the, the people who started the Masajid here, they bought their mentality from the old world. And what worked back home, I don't think it's working over here. So the sweetness of faith is not intertwined with the necessity, of course, of ritual. Ritual is the vehicle for spiritual uh, enlightenment, you spiritual refinement. You but can't to have stop one without there, the other. To stop there is 
it's very important to highlight, right? Because even Quranically speaking, uh, certain nations were condemned for settling with the exterior, right? We are God's people from this bloodline. We live and uh, practice this way. But on the inside, it was uh, corruption mm -hmm. uh, of the greatest magnitude. Then on the other extreme, you have people who reduced God to an emotion. God is love, right? And so our deen came to rescue people from extremism. And so combining between the two, my teachers would often say that one of the biggest challenges of the ummah right now is uh, an overemphasis on uh, doctrine. Doctrine in the sense of not our beliefs, of course, mm -hmm. those are the most uh, spiritually nourishing and invigorating, but doctrine in the form of like a checklist type theology that's yeah, really yeah. just there for like identity confirmation, sectarian mm -hmm. memberships mm -hmm. and stuff. Too much focus on doctrine and even on legality. Yeah. to become hyper-technical. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. a downfall of many nations, right? And not enough of a focus on morality and spirituality. And uh, and, and, then, I, and I, I think I'm going to have to concur with you on that. And then it also feels like when they do decide to focus on the morality, it's um, it's too heavy-handed, you know? And I can't tell you how many times when I was growing up at the, mes at the Masajid, there was like a hyper-fixation on this kid's haircut or, oh, we saw him out outside after school smoking a cigarette or him doing, a, you know. And instead of kind of the masajid and the people running the masajid, having the understanding that it's like, okay, you know, like these young guys are going to be out here and they're facing, they're facing trials that they could have never imagined back home at the masajid that they were growing up in. And, then, you know, instead of identifying like, okay, you know, like we need to bring them into the fold and we need to not point the finger at them and we need to not ostracize them, there was... It's it's uh, the way that they handled so many of those situations turned people away from the masajid. Yeah, and if you have a young guy and he's doing something that's not necessarily right, like how to win friends and influence people 101, you know, like the right thing to do is not to humiliate them in front of the whole community. You know, the right thing is not to walk up to them and be like, this haircut is wrong. It's like he comes here like what, once a month, twice a month, maybe like now he definitely doesn't want to come back here. And so there was that. There was they, they were kind of lacking that uh, interpersonal understanding of how to kind of like bring people in and kind of win them over. And I always think about how I don't know. I don't know how many years I think it was exactly in the prophet's uh, prophethood. Right. But it was the first portion of his prophethood. It was more about conveying the morality of the dean and kind of winning the hearts and minds of right. the people. And then in the latter half of his prophethood it was about giving them the dictates kind of giving them what the restrictions Do's were and like. don'ts and you know what, what was the split was it 13 9 the years i mean the majority of the law came mm -hmm. down in the second half if you will but it was the shorter second half it mm -hmm. was in the medinan period mm -hmm. in the meccan period the first 13 years of the 23 or 22 and a half uh yes as aisha radiallahu anha the wife of the prophet sallallahu alaihi she said uh the very first thing to come down from the Quran were the shorter chapters, mm -hmm. Mufassal, the shorter chapters. She says, and they contained predominantly, what was the major theme there? She said, mention of paradise and the hellfire. She said, and then when people became inclined, right? Now when they're coming looking for it, mm -hmm. the do's and the don'ts and the mm -hmm. framework, right? When they became inclined to Islam, the halal and the haram, the lawful and unlawful came down. She even went on to say in that same narration, uh, that if the first thing to come down from the Quran was stop drinking wine, the people would have said, we'll never stop drinking. Mm -hmm. And if the first thing to come down from the Quran was stop fornicating, they would have said, we'll never give it up. And maybe that's a good segue for, uh, for a follow-up question here. Why is it that the masajid are lacking? I would pose that question to you but I, I mean I think there's so Where many almost. right answers uh, I think one of the first of them to be honest that we don't want to recognize the magnitude of the challenges you put it right there's no one there that far who's like drinking wine using substance fornicating there's no dating going on in the community there's no pornography or you know there's no peer pressure and all this other stuff yeah. and so you think oh we're, we're already at you know Islam 4.0 <laughs> we can jump right to it. Yeah, that was that was always something that really put me off. It was it almost felt like 
the people who ran the masajid, they had, they they conflated addressing an issue with endorsing it. They almost had this idea where, okay, if we don't talk about it, it's not real. But, yeah, I mean, we all instinctively understand if you don't shine the light on something, it's going to grow. It's going to get worse. And so there was, there's like so many hairy questions and topics, especially that the youth need to address substance abuse, uh, substance abuse, like you said, the use of pornography, sexual relationships between, you know, young men and women. They Doubting the faith to begin with. Crises of faith. We didn't even get there, yeah. you know. But yeah, and he, and if you, if 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 the if the people in the masajid aren't getting these questions addressed in the masajid, guess where they're going to get those questions answered? From the worst places possible, you know. Chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do it. <clears throat> Chat GPT is. Um, I've I've quizzed Chat GPT and it's very careful. It's like, I can't give you moral guidance, but, you know, here's what this religion says, here's what that religion says, and here's what that religion says. But, like, I, I remember when I was growing up, the climate has kind of changed online, you know? And a lot of people out there are kind of starting to recognize the wisdom behind more traditional approaches. Uh, but when I was growing up, it was like a free-for-all. It was like, oh, yeah, if it feels good, do it. You know, there's, there's no right or wrong. Don't judge anybody. And... For a lot of young people who were growing up in that climate, contrast that with what they were getting at the Masajid. And it was like there was no kind of understanding that these are difficulties that people are dealing with. And it always kind of made me upset because when you read, you know, the, the Seerah of the Prophet and you read the Quran, it doesn't stray away from addressing any of these topics. Like from what I understand, people had no problem approaching the Prophet وسلم, in the Masajid and asking him questions about intimacy. I can't imagine anyone was doing that at the masajid that we grew up at, you know? And if, if it's not in the masajid, where? That's a huge problem. Why else aren't masajid offering these things? So we, we said that there's a certain uh, heightened sensitivity. Mm -hmm. uh, the walls of taboo are too high, right? Mm -hmm. they, can't, they're not, they don't seem surmountable. And so people feel like this is like an, an angelic, uh, way of life it's not fit for us human beings why else you think look to give to kind of give them the benefit of the doubt i think that there was a, a huge shock for a lot of the people that came here and they started masajid they didn't have to address so many of these issues you know for a lot of the people who who came here and they started masajid a person who had a certain haircut back home was a bad person they don't realize it here that's just the regular haircut Back home, because they were living in these uh, majority Muslim communities, the 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 burden of responsibility of kind of maintaining a baseline of acceptability was kind of distributed amongst the entire community. Whereas when you come here, it all falls on the masjid. And now suddenly, whereas like if everybody maybe had like one percent of the share of the responsibility. All of a sudden, at the masjid, especially with like the people who are running the masjid, maybe each of those individuals for the entire community was bearing 20-30% of the responsibility. 20 times more than what they had to do back home. And that's an unreasonable expectation, right? I, I mean, uh, that's something uh, like I, I heard said, recently from doubt. someone who's very much into masjid systems. And I hope to, to host him as one of the SME subject matter experts, inshallah, for this podcast. But he said if you actually sit there and do like a, an inductive scan of what masjids are expected to do, mm -hmm. those could represent 13, 14, 15 institutions in other countries, in Muslim-majority countries. Like nobody comes to the masjid in Muslim-majority countries for Hajj and Umrah services, for instance, right? Yeah. Nobody comes to the masjid for social services per se. Mm -hmm. Nobody comes to the masjid for a janazah. There's actually a janazah ministry, right? Yeah, a yeah. funeral ministry. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, even marital issues, arbitrations, disputes, re conflict resolutions, uh, education. There's an education ministry. And so I think having unreasonable expectations of masajid, uh, I mean, yes, masajid should be places of trust that mm -hmm. facilitate and guide you on where you should and shouldn't be uh, looking for solutions. And maybe that's one of the downfalls of masajid, that they're not religiously informed enough to tell you it's not wrong to seek mental health uh, solutions, even if sometimes they're chemical. There is a precedent in the Sunnah for antidepressants. Now go check them out. Fine. But I do think that too much is expected of the masajid. But 
at I, the same time, yeah, the fact that you just said, and I'll I'll leave you to run with this if you like, that we're playing catch up right now. We're, we're we're caught off guard because I think it's healthy to recognize that. I'm not sitting here listing what's wrong with Masajid. We want to be solution oriented oriented in this podcast. Uh, we have to realize that we're late to the game and that there's a there's a humongous complexity here and we don't want to underestimate it so many times the little bit of like just know how i may have picked up by osmosis from people and places i've gone to and through uh, i've brought it to masajid and the fixed mindset said to me stop overcomplicating things Stop being so corporate. And I'm not corporate. I don't know ABCs <laughs> of corporate management. But the fact that management is a science and that we're playing catch up, I think owning that uh, is a missing puzzle piece that is dead center in the uh, in the portrait. A hundred percent. But, you know, I, I do kind of want to push back a little bit on how you said that back home, the Mezid was not expected to do as much as we expect from the Mezid over here. And that's that's fine, back home you know those are muslim majority countries with over a thousand years of muslim history muslims have been in the united states for what now like majority muslims like i know that there was muslims who kind of came over from africa but we're we've been here for like what a hundred years now 80 90 years we have to kind of expect more from the masajid and if if we as muslims 100 percent, right um i kind of get the sense and, and this is kind of coming just kind of like 80th story, very high level view, looking at like the culture and where things are going. It feels like the, the, the culture in the Western world is kind of getting to almost a breaking point where there was a decadence for a while, but now the, the bill is kind of coming due. And a lot of the people who maybe five, 10 years ago would have never considered uh, what religion has to offer, now they're thirsting for it. There's a crisis of meaning in the West, relationships are falling apart, the norms between the genders are straining, things that people did not consider, you know, would ever happen. Uh, the social issues are starting to get to a boiling point because there was no baseline, you know, everything was do whatever you feel like. And now it feels like the Western world is getting to this place where they're, they're, they're thirsting for kind of a baseline so that they can build off of. The, the families, they feel like they're under attack. The social institutions are under attack. There's a, a sense of uncertainty everywhere in the air. And as a Muslim, I'm looking at this, and, and, and I'm, it's not only just because I'm a Muslim. A lot of the Western world is also kind of starting to look to Islam for this guidance. If we as Muslims know that we have the cure for humanity, we can't, we can't kind of shy away and keep on applying old approaches that worked back home in our home countries we're dealing with a totally different animal and we're also and we're also operating in a totally different age like the world moves so much faster now and if we believe islam is timeless it, and then it, it has to have a built-in mechanism and it does to adapt to the changing dynamics of the world i Absolutely. think uh, the assumption that religious institutions are religiously informed needs to be challenged sometimes what i mean you, there's what do you mean by that there's so much to this. Number one, uh, there's a huge percentage of masajid that don't have religious leadership to begin with, right? They don't have like a scholar or an imam or a student of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they believe what we brought over, what we inherited of Islam mm -hmm. is no how enough, right? It's a mess. And then you also have, <laughs> because that is a cultural identity from a particular culture that mm -hmm. is time-stamped that will become obsolete, like yeah. cultures are fluid. And it definitely doesn't work too, but like off of that point, I'm sorry, I'm cutting you off here. You're but good, man. Like, you know, off of that point, I think it's one of the things that puts off a lot of people on the outside of Islam. They look in and they're like, oh, it's an Arab thing. And, you know, and that's kind of a remnant from these people who came here and they started Masajid and they ran the Masajid in a Arab kind of way. But... Islam is not an Arab thing. It's not, you know, uh, an East Asian thing. It's a, it's a universal thing for all of humanity. It just so happened that it came down in the Arabic language. Go on. No, so that's sort of one cross-section of uh, the mindsets in certain masajid that, you know, what we know Islam enough. What do you need an imam for? We'll just, like, bring someone and give Jummah here, give him his gas money and send him on his way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we don't need someone coming here to tell us yeses and noes and halas and harams. Uh, and that's a humongous disservice because 
the Prophet ﷺ said to us that, you know, when the scholars begin to dissipate and people take those unlearned as their leaders, they go astray. And so they are the security mechanism. They are the inheritors of the prophets. They are those who know how to, inshallah, uh, apply uh, to newly emerging effects the principles of prophetic living. And it's, it's a specialization like any other, rather it is the most sacred one. And, and then you have uh, challenges where the scholarly class themselves may not be uh, privy enough or aware enough of the stakes, and so they're not capable of the pros, cons, calculus, right? And also sometimes, let's just be honest, there's misplaced concreteness. We create red lines with religious languaging that you cannot cross when they're not actually red lines. Give me an example Whether ideological or legal in terms of medheb or otherwise, do we have the luxury to be sort of particular about these things when 23% of first-generation Muslim Americans, that famous Pew number, Pew Research Center, first-generation Muslim Americans, 23% of them don't even no longer say we're, they're Muslim anymore. So we don't have the luxury to, you know, create, you know, replicas of how I learned Islam. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to keep Muslims Muslim at this point. Yeah, yeah. Can you give me a, an example of like the, the rigidity that you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, ideological tensions, uh, legal tensions in Masajid. Mm -hmm. Uh, like whether or not you could wipe likes tense atmospheres they drive people out of masajid mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right or wrong yeah no like, for sure uh, the moon sighting issue the halal meat issue the, the you whether know, or not you could wipe on your socks when you do, uh, do. are these things do they even you know matter compared to the fact that we're talking about kufr and iman people are on the cliff of uh, of severing their lifeline to this faith and jeopardizing their hereafter before yeah. their their worldly life mm -hmm. so proper upright, nuanced religious leadership not being present in Masajid is very costly. And that's something, inshallah, I hope to dedicate a bunch of episodes uh, to as well, inshallah. So let us say there are lots of challenges, and I think anyone who's listening to us already agrees, even if we're going to sort of uh, prioritize them differently. What's the bigger one? What's the lion's share? Me and you may even sort of like line them up differently. But let us assume someone is listening right now and mm -hmm. they uh, can't get to their masjid to realize that they need uh, a growth mindset. They need to build that infrastructure. They need to become more inclusive. They need to sort of mature their foundations in a way that can serve on a higher level at least, right? Maybe not the, the, the idealistic that we're over, you know, projecting that they mm -hmm. should serve mm -hmm. in all these fronts. Let's just imagine that nothing, we're not able to move the needle whatsoever. They're not interested in technology. They're not interested in bringing the youth in. They're not thinking of like adopting new ways. They just want it to be their little space. Want to feel nostalgic. Want to feel like I'm back home. Yeah. Is walking away ever justified? I mean, I, I always talk to you about this, right? And I think to kind of take from what you've told me is you really got to that's a decision that you can't take lightly, you know, like before you walk away, you kind of got to take that Lion King approach to things. You, you gotta, you gotta take a look at the measure and be like, okay, like you're so lucky. Disney was less controversial. Uh, <laughs> Disney in was in the kinda... Lion King days, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's a fact, but Disney eh, we won't even get into it. But I, I would say that before you walk away from the masjid, if you're the, if you're the person who identified that there's something wrong at the masjid, it might be that you're the person that's needed at the masjid to remedy things. And if you're the last person at the table, you can't be the loudest voice. But if you're at the masjid and you're, you're giving it uh, an honest go and you're trying to, to, to fix things from inside and you're hitting a wall, it's a dream of mine at some point to start a masjid. But I almost kind of feel like a phony saying that on this podcast because I don't have the means to do so whatsoever. But, you know, you, you look at MCC in Brooklyn and that's a, it's, it's the most invigorating masjid that I've seen my whole life in New York City. The, the guy who runs the masjid, Muhammad Bay, he, he grew up in these masjid that were fraught with all these problems that we're talking about, that were turning away the youth from the masjid. And because he approached the problem with, with that good intention and trust in God, he took a moonshot, and I feel like that's 
it's something that you don't see so much in our communities where people don't take those moonshots. Oh, it's expensive. Property taxes are our, our community doesn't have the money. Whereas Muhammad, you know, he, he he took a first principle approach where he was like, this is what the community needs. This is what we need to do. No one else is doing it. If we step up and do it, we're going to invigorate the people and they're going to line up behind us. And I think they have something like one point eight million dollars that they need. like property values are crazy in New York City. But the masjid is packed every night. And so that should be an example for everybody. Like you always talk about how we 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 don't have nearly as many masjid in the United States as we need. What is it? Like we have 25% of the number that we actually need. We're going to have to start... If new- the masjids were populated, right? Right. So it's severely underserved. So... If the if the answer is that we need to build more masajid and you're in a community where you you see that there are certain needs that are not being met, you know it's it's not serving the community in the proper way. That's definitely something that you should consider, you know, if you have the means to do so, and don't approach it from such a rational perspective where you're like, oh, I don't have the money. Like, if your heart is in the right place, and and you 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 give people what it is that they need, the people will line up behind you. And I think MCC and Muhammad Bahi's example really speaks to that. I don't know how much he paid you to say that. He didn't, he didn't pay me anything. But I'm I haven't spoken to him. A check <laughs> covering the costs of these first few episodes. I, th- I think if anybody Hope has, you're hearing us, Mr. Bet, wherever you are. I think if anybody has any money, they should send it to MCC. I think that's what they should be doing. Okay, we're going to cut the episode right here <laughs> at this point. <laughs> so, okay. Uh... Fair is fair. Let me uh, let me agree. Uh, I vividly recall entering that masjid one night for tarawih and seeing, and this is a bit odd, right? Seeing the amount of youth praying tarawih wall to wall in the shoe area, everywhere, covered in earrings, tattoos, and whatever else may ordinarily be, you know, uh, something not necessarily approved of Islamically, it actually made me so happy because this was like a reconnaissance mission, right? I'm going to go get these guys from the streets. I'm going to go get these guys from wherever they drifted. I'm going to show them that the best of life mm-hmm. exists mm-hmm. within Islam mm-hmm. Absolutely. by sort of, I had to move the Muslims out the way a little bit <laughs> to show them the Islam. So fair is fair. I, 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 I'm, I'm needing to concede to that. I, I think the issue of... Uh, is justified ever walk. I don't think anyone would disagree uh, that, you know, we need more masajid unless they're oblivious to the numbers that you refer to. I mean, where you got those numbers from, uh, I often tell people, just do the math. You got like 4 million Muslims in America. You got like 2,500 masjids in America. That's 1,600 Muslims per masjid. Mm-hmm. Uh, and almost nobody could think of a masjid that holds 1,600 people. Very few in certain parts of the country. The vast majority of them are like storefronts that hold one, 200 people, and so on and so forth. So all those people that you see on the day of Eid, not just Jumu'ah, that hold, that, you know, uh, look like the, make the masjid look like everybody's here and it's busting at the seams, this is just capacity-wise, 20% of your community, 25% of your community. The rest of them have never set foot in the masjid. So we need more masjids. 100%. It's really about how, I guess, we're going to go about it. I am not against whenever there's a deadlock, whenever there's stagnation for someone to just move over. It's far superior than conflict. Mm-hmm. That'll sort of empty the current masjid. Go open, leave it that masjid full, and go open your own masjid. Don't do it across the street. I mean, how you do it is going to be, <laughs> you know, like uh, the branding issue, the uh, being magnanimous, not mm-hmm. being united front against anyone, or sort of campaigning against anyone. Basically, because the whole idea is for you to model the superior alternative. Yeah, yeah. Right. And and I believe that people, when they see things happening right, they will catch up. And I've seen this firsthand, and it's not a theoretical. Over and over again. And as our teachers sometimes tell us that sometimes it requires us to uh, separate in order for us to unite. If we stay in each other's noses, it might be just counterproductive, yeah, right? for sure, for sure. Sometimes we need to divide. To expand. And our deen is not necessarily against division uh, of the bodies. Whenever Islam is saying we're one brotherhood and the Quran is telling us, you know, you're a single family and all of this, it's the division of the hearts that's dispraised. The, mm-hmm. the rancor, the grudges, the cultish 
whether it's a personality cult or an ideology cult or otherwise, so long as we can account for those, uh, sometimes just building a non-existent model is just easier than trying to fix from within a pre-existing model. Uh, so it's a pros cons calculus, and you gotta be objective and sort of mashura and ask people and make sure that when it does happen, doesn't happen out of resentment, but out of genuine concern for for upping the game. I want to ask, uh, you know, to, just to bring this full circle as we close out. And again, this is a primer episode, and I'm really happy you're my guy, who I always not just vent to, but no problem, no we try problem. to think these things through together. What is the cost of leaving our masjids at the State of the Union, <laughs> or the status quo? And what I mean by that in particular uh, is what's going to happen if none of the current masjid level up. level up and no superior alternatives start emerging fast enough? I think it's going to be devastating, not just for the, the, the Muslim community, but I also think that it's going to be devastating for for humanity where those messages are. Um, How? Look, the the masajid are the the houses of Allah. You know, they're like the 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 physical place that you go to, where the highest ideal should be. That's where the that's where you should have. The most optimism. That's where you should, you know, be looking at the highest ideal. That's where things should be as pure as possible. That's where people go to purify themselves, you know. And if the masajid are chaotic, if they're houses of resentment, if people are fighting over there, if there's anger, if people are not happy when they're at the masajid, uh, the the masjid is the place where people are going to 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 aim as high as they possibly can, you know? It's bit Allah. That's where you're going to pray. That's where you're going to connect with the Most High. That's where you're you're looking for the highest ideals. If the masajid are, are not places of purification and connecting with your fellow Muslims, connecting with your fellow man... Uh, places of connection. I know, love that. Not, not even just places of connection, right? But places where the highest ideals are realized, you know? But connection is such an overlooked part of how to imbibe ideals, right? Like, in terms of the psychology of conviction they often talk about, the number one reason why people are convinced of stuff is because of association, right? Why do people drift in their ideals? It's because they interface for most of or all of the time with a society that has different ideals. So they just adopt those ideals, right? Mm -hmm. And if I try to have op opposing ideals out there, I can't connect with anyone. And I have to live with the pressure year in and year out. It, it takes a toll after a while of I'm a misfit. I'm the weirdo. I'm the uh, the guy who's not drinking at the party. I, And so the masjid represents... Uh, a rallying point for people with those ideals so those ideals don't get eroded. Mm -hmm. And then we learn and compete in climbing. But well, to begin with, simply connecting the fraternity of faith mm -hmm. is extremely powerful. Well, Yanni, I would, also build off of, I would also build off on that too. And I'd say that, and this is something that I saw growing up in the Masajid. When you grow up in the Masajid, they're operating at a certain standard, right? And then you go off to college and they're much more organized. There's a much higher standard. Or, you know, you maybe you even go to, like, establishments in the neighborhood, and the people at the establishments meet you in a much more pleasant fashion than you're being met in the masjid. And before long, I think the association that a lot of people wind up making, and I definitely made this association, is like, okay, the masjid is a chaotic place where they operate at a low, you know, low standard of quality. The masjid is a place where you're not going to see smiling faces and people who are welcoming. And or, ple or smell pleasant odors sometimes. I didn't even want to say that, but yeah, that's a problem, you know. that happens. Or find a place for my wife to pray. You or know? someone's going to understand that I just became Muslim mm -hmm. a month ago and I'm still sort of getting my bearings. And so if, if, every, time you, if every time you go to the masjid... What the the picture that you're seeing is negative? Are you surprised that people are going to start associating that negativity with the dean? Are you surprised that people are going to start straying away from the dean? Like, how often are you going to keep on putting people in negative environment and then getting surprised when they tell you like, "Khalas, 
I don't want to do this anymore. And that's why I say that the, the stakes are so high for the for the Muslims and for all the humanity that's that's in the vicinity of the Masajid. Because if the if the if the Muslims are starting to leave the Masajid because the Masajid are not a welcoming environment, a place where they can connect, a place where they you know, you see the manifestation of the highest ideals, then what hope is there for the non Muslims that we ideally like to pull into these masajid? Yeah, no chance at that point, Allah forbid. You know? I mean, the Qur'an, because time is going to chase us off of this episode, the Qur'an does remind us that righteous people uh, always remember to pray for those who preceded them in faith, right? رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِيْخَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَ بِالْإِيمَانِ Oh Allah, uh, forgive us and those who preceded us in faith. Mm -hmm. And I think to compare sort of ourselves or our bright ideas to them, not that you're doing this, uh, but I can imagine this being heard in that voice by some people as sort of ingratitude uh, not, or, not at all. or resentment. No, no, I and uh, alhamdulillah, uh, I've after a while gotten myself into the habit of realizing these are apples and oranges. Like whatever little bit we may be able to notice of the biases of others should not make us forget that we too have our biases, we too have our our blind spots. In fact, I used to always tell myself that, like, it's not their fault. I blame JFK Airport <laughs> <laughs> because the when I grew up in New York City, mm -hmm. like, the youth that were leaving the Masajid went unnoticed. Why? Because in New York City, in particular, JFK, right, where people usually fly in from when they're migrating to this country or fly into. Uh, it's constantly replenishing the masajid with the immigrant demographic. Mm -hmm. And so the masjid's full, full. The masjid's overflowing. I need another floor. So it's hidden. They don't really and see so whatever is falling from the bottom of the bucket is being replenished from the top. From the top. And so that's one of the issues. And also, uh, to be fair, uh, many a times I get stuck uh, or I try to catch myself early from comparing masajid with churches and synagogues. And that also is an unfair comparison I'm not saying there isn't work to do. I wouldn't have put this podcast for sure, together for sure. if I don't believe there's work that can be done and swiftly and that we need to ramp it up. Mm -hmm. But we can't compare two generations, right? These people that did come here in the past two, three generations came. And yes, it is a problem that Islam was an afterthought in general for Muslims in, in the West. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is what it is. Right now, we got here. How are we going to pray Jummah? Nearest Masjid is nine hours away. I got to, you know, like build my little house on the prairie, get 12 sure, people in there for Jumu'ah or 40, depending on your madhab. And so they're playing catch up, right? And so, the, oh, wait, I got, so all they could do is build a Jumu'ah juncture. For sure. And so Allah knows, and I just wanted to assert that, that we are accepting and excusing and admiring all mm -hmm. of the sacrifice that went in when no one even else was even thinking about it. But now we need to take it to the next level because the cost is extremely high. These 100%. masajid are are the Ark of Nuh alayhi yeah, salam. If you're not you going to survive from the, the flood, boat, you won't survive the flood. Look, I would I would build off of the point that you're saying too, where as much as I I felt like I was burned by the masajid, any credit where credit is due. Um, yeah, and he, as as someone who grew up in a working class family in New York City, that's rough. Um, the the advantages I felt like I had against my peers in public school and even in college, I felt like was my Muslim upbringing in the masajid. When you, yani, even even as, as bad as the masajid were, you know, uh, as many problems as the masajid had, the, the grounding that they gave the kids that grew up in the masjid was a much firmer grounding than the kids who wind up not growing in a house of faith. So to, to understand that there is a God, to understand that there is one truth, to understand that there are objective morals and ideals, it grounds you far more than the kids who were growing up where they thought, you know, there is no right or wrong or, or they didn't feel guilty if they were doing something wrong. And it's no surprise that I'm back here, sitting here having this conversation with you. And it, I wouldn't be here had it not been for those masajid. And it's always so easy to point at the past generations and kind of identify that the wrong that they did, but they did a lot of good too, and they were not working with much. And it's it's like there's always going to be that tension between the generations, but there's so much more to gain by kind of extending your hand out to that older generation and telling them like, look, you have something that I don't, you know, help me. 
uh, instead of just kind of burning it and saying like, oh, they ran these terrible messages. Like, that's not how I feel at all. You know, like, um, no, for sure. You didn't come off that way. <laughs> but I, but I, I do understand how, again, this could have been perceived as just ingrates. We're just not. trying to be honest no, to no, put it sure. all on the table, inshallah. We, it's a clunky start. We're trying our best to sort of justify why there's like uh, an alarm that needs to be going off. Definitely. And we need to scramble to do this right. And we hope we can be able to reconcile between being methodical and being sort of moved to make change and make change fast. Most certainly. Uh, my teacher once, uh, one of my, my teachers, he, he says something very profound and, you know, to honor our elders and the pioneers. Uh, I do wish to share it as, as we close out here. He used to say, a person must never equate between someone who tried to do the right thing and fell short and between someone who tried to do the wrong thing and succeeded. You know, I someone like who's trying to spread mischief in the world and accomplished it. Mm hmm should never be seen as equal, someone who had a good even intention. equal, let alone superior. Yeah. Someone who had a good intention, but it didn't materialize in, in the way that they thought or hoped it would. So may Allah reward them in ways that only Ameen. He can Ameen. Uh, and help us do right by what they've planted of seeds mm -hmm. and help us sort of, you know, uh, Listen, I, I cross-pollinate and, and grow this in the most healthy way, inshallah. I mean, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan for your time. Oh, and... Uh, it's going on uh, on 1 a.m. soon, so may I'm Allah okay make it a are. blessed Ramadan <laughs> night. No, I'm not good. <laughs> uh, Jazakallah khairan. And well, everyone yeah, listening, do me. share your feedback uh, in the comments and what you'd like to hear about and what areas and sectors of Masajid uh, we can try to shed some light on to help others uh, improve on, what challenges in Masajid we can help mitigate. Mm -hmm. uh, any closing thoughts, Brother Khalid? I'm I'm glad that you're doing this because um, I think you found a niche that is underserved, but if properly addressed, the impacts of it are going to be far-reaching because there's so many people uh, who have strayed away from the masajid and there are so many people who need Islam in their life and uh, they're not going to find it in the, the proper form except for at the masajid. And so I couldn't agree more. There's a, you've chosen a high leverage uh, point to stand at. So it's way above my pay grade. I'm hoping someone will take it and mature it. Uh, but we wanted to start it somewhere, centralize it in a certain place. And may Allah accept and, and take it to the moon. Bismillah. Jazakallah khairan.